for staying with Citizen and still continuing this conversation. And my guests are still with me, Professor Walter Jaoko, Director of CAVI and a member of HIV and AIDS Tribunal. Dr. Celestine Mugambi is still here. She's the head of the Technical Support NSDCC. Joyce Uma, Senior Programs Officer, Y Plus Global. And Malcolm X, Andrew Maisha Youth, still with me discussing the issue around HIV and AIDS infection. We know now that based on the statistics, the infections are going down, but there's a cohort that is a bit of a concern. But Dr. Mugambi, there's something you mentioned which I found interesting. That there's an increasing infection in women, but we're losing more boys and young men. Okay. Why is that? So it's, Seems it's contradictory not, to Okay. So it's not really increasing infection. Infections yeah. generally have reduced. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the proportion of young girls and women who get new HIV infections, it is higher than the boys. And for a long time, we lost focus on the boys and the young men. But like I said, we are losing more boys and young men to AIDS-related causes. And you have to think about our definition of masculinity mm. as a society and as a culture, okay? That affects health-seeking behavior. There's cultural practices. There's issue of what it is to be a man. There's issues of a man does not fall sick. There's issues of a man is one who has to be out there earning a living. So what time does he have to go to the health facility? So even if a young man gets, we're discussing on break, even if you have a little cold, you will not go to a health facility. So that, those are the traits that we are seeing. So even as we, we do HIV programming, we're also rethinking it and bringing in issues of promoting positive masculinity, uh, positive culture and positive seeking behavior. And a lot of the time it has been skewed towards you program, you target the man for the woman. That's what has happened. But for now we're targeting the boys and the young men for themselves. Can you go get sorted first? Then in turn, you support the women and the children around your environment and around your community. Mm. So we, it is a lot of work because you cannot do it as a government. You have to involve every sphere of society, right from the family, the community, the social gatekeepers, because they are there, because there are some things which we cannot debunk as a government. Yeah? So a lot of engagement is being thought through and has already started. And most important, like we were saying on break, young people don't go to health facilities, young men more so don't go to health facilities. Mm -hmm. So if we have a health facility with all these beautiful interventions and nobody's coming, then we have lost the plot. And so how also we are shifting the dynamic is that we are going to where they are. And Malcolm talked about the rally. We knew we'd find young people there. Let us go and engage them. So our community outreaches is what we are trying to strengthen. So we take services to where they are. But most important, and they talked about HIV not being an issue, um, the survey I told you earlier we had done, we actually asked them which of the following uh, conditions would you rather not have? And we had pregnancy, we had HIV, we had STIs, and we had cancer. And over 80% said cancer. And we were very shocked. It was not even pregnancy or HIV or STIs. And so you think about it, if that is going to be the entry point, yeah. then why not use cancer as the entry point, then layer on HIV, STI, and pregnancy? If pregnancy is what they are concerned about, then pregnancy prevention will be your entry point, and then you layer everything else. So it's about going to where your audience is, knowing your, your audience, and being <coughs> responsive to their needs. So your message is only as good as your deliverer yeah. in the delivery platform. You can have the best, but you're not communicating to anybody. Yeah. yeah. The reason I was wondering about that, and you said that generally the infections have, uh, the, the, the transmission has reduced, but yeah. on the women specifically, the younger women, mm. are we seeing a cross-generational infection? Because if the young men are the ones who are dying, but the increasing rates are in women, mm. who are they getting it from? Again, culture and gender. Look yeah. at the gender dynamics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the issues with girls and women in this country is gender inequality, gender-based violence, poverty, lack of education, just what we think <laughs> is the social construct and the definition of being a woman and womanhood. So that does work to our disadvantage, isn't it? When you have in some communities girls as young as 10, 11 who are married, girls as young as 10, 11, 12 who are pregnant, of course that increases their vulnerabilities. There are some counties we have gone to and you will find a 19-year-old with five children mm. at the age of 19. You go to a health facility and you have a 13-year-old girl pregnant, her mother is also pregnant. Her mother was a teenage mother. So unless you stop that vicious cycle, teen moms, childhood of them becoming uh, grandmothers when they are much younger, they're just becoming teen moms, it's, we have to stop that, yeah? But it all comes down to gender, social inequalities, which also we are trying to work with the relevant ministries to bridge and to stop. Okay. Yeah. Prof, let me bring you back on this. During your submissions earlier on, you said that PrEP and PEP are now not being used for what they were meant for. 
Mm. First, what is the difference and what are mm. they being used for now? So PrEP, the difference between PrEP and PEP is uh, PrEP is what you call pre-exposure prophylaxis and PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. What is exposure? The exposure is a, a risk to HIV. What, what have you been exposed to or what are you potentially going to be exposed to that makes you, puts you at risk of getting HIV? So PrEP, we, um, if somebody anticipates uh, exposure to possible infection, so for example, in a discordant couple, you have a discordant couple. One person is HIV positive, the other one is HIV negative. The HIV negative person would take PrEP uh, in the event that they have sexual intercourse that is unprotected, then uh, it reduces the, uh, risk, his or her risk of becoming infected. Okay, so you're taking it before the exposure to HIV. Uh, PEP, on the other side, is you are given medication after you've been exposed but it's given within a certain period of time, uh, within 36 hours. Uh, the best is immediately, but within 36 hours. Uh, in the event that you were exposed, then this medication will go and kill the viruses and then prevents you from becoming infected. So for example, in gender-based violence, mm -hmm. in situations of sexual assault, when you go to the hospital, uh, in addition to being given something to prevent you from getting pregnant, you're also given PEP to prevent you from uh, getting HIV. Or healthcare workers, you accidentally drawing blood from somebody who is HIV positive and then you, you inject yourself, you prick yourself with a needle, you, then you take PEP. So that's the difference. Yeah, but you're saying that it, they're not being used for what they were meant for now. Is so now, so now you, find, you, 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 you find there's some guidelines on use of PrEP, for example. Yeah. And uh, so examples that I've given you, like in discordant couples, in uh, uh, medical people exposed by needles. And mm. So that is for, uh, for, yeah, for, yeah, for post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm. But now there are people who Every time they have sexual intercourse, they're not sure was that person because they never, um, they don't know the HIV status of that person. Every time they have sexual intercourse, they take PEP. Yeah. Every time they have sexual intercourse, they take PEP. Or then those who are always anticipating, so they take repeatedly. You know, so you take, uh, you're anticipating you're going to have a sexual intercourse with somebody, you don't know their status, you take it today. Uh, the following day, you're taking again and again and again and again. So there are guidelines that uh, have been put as to how, uh, when uh, to take to take this. So that is and what. Yeah, long-term effects. Yeah, just like any other medication. So, th fortunately, for the drugs that we use for treatment, both treatment and PrEP and um, PEP are the same drugs that we use for treatment of HIV. They have been refined over and over that side effects have become less and less compared to the drugs that we're using at the beginning. At the beginning of the HIV uh, epidemic, the drugs that we were taking were highly toxic, but we had not, but over the, over the period of time, they have become more and more refined. So they have uh, risks, but they're not as much as they were in, at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. Jesse, let me bring you back on this. You mentioned something which I found interesting. You said that when uh, people are having conversations and you act like taking drugs every day is okay, but the truth is it's not okay. Mm -hmm. How then do we change this conversation so that the stigma doesn't come back, but also the reality and the gravity of the situation is still out there? Because where, where do you draw the line? This is where my problem is. Yeah. And also there was a time I had a conversation with you and you said young people still have this mentality of looking at you and thinking, yes, this one is the right one. There's no possible infection here. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with this? Uh, thanks, Trevor. So again, uh, basing on the conversation that we've had, that the main problem that we, uh, we foresee as young people having is the lack of information, right? Or inadequate in information mm -hmm. or um, non-factual, improper, all that. But with the or rise sugar of... sugar-coated information. Yes, so sugar-coated seems... information. Mm. Um, with the rise of TikTok and other social media platforms, we've seen um, a rising number of social media influencers, um, those who are living with HIV also coming uh, on board and also trying to show, uh, to show the world that living with HIV is hard, but it's, it's manageable, right? And uh, what they usually... Now it's progressing that the same people who gave the 
sugar-coated information are now also coming up boldly to talk about the realities of, of, of living with HIV, for example. A case in point, just recently, um, I, I, I am a programmer. I've programmed for, for young people um, living with HIV for the longest time. I've talked about undetectable equals untransmittable for the longest time, but mm. I never put this into practice mm. until recently, where I had to start from the basics of disclosure and having to trust science and um, uh, that uh, when I'm, my viral load is undetectable, then I cannot transmit the virus to anyone else. Uh, this was a challenge that I've never encountered in my 10 years of uh, knowing my status and um, being on treatment. For the first time, I had to uh, go to a pharmacy and buy a test kit and prick my finger and prick the other person's finger and take this whole conversation to, um, you know, I, I, I am not infectious in this manner because I'm taking my, my, my treatment and I am virally suppressed. That conversation went well in that the person trusted the source of the information, which was me. Now, the sad part was that the source of information, again, which was me, was struggling on the inside on what if science is wrong? Yeah. And this is, it's not because science is wrong. This is a very proven um, and very foolproof um, uh, scientific research that undetectable uh, HIV viral load equals untransmittable. But at a personal level, these are things that you struggle with and you most of the time mm -hmm. are afraid to come point uh, out there and say that this is a, is a challenge that I'm facing or I'm, I'm tired of taking medicine every day, or sometimes <coughs> I, I miss uh, taking the pill because I forgot, mm. or because I didn't eat, or because I went out with my friends and I didn't tell them, or I went out with my friends and I forgot to take my medicine. Such are the realities of living with HIV that we also do not say. But we are trying to shift from using threats, using scary um, um, analogies to prevent people from getting HIV. What we are saying is the reality is the virus is manageable. That's the, that's the first solid truth. The other solid truth is that it also comes with its own challenges. We've talked about uh, side effects of HIV treatment, for example, and the prof also mentioned that, of course, tre uh, treatment has progressed. We're doing better now, but there's still more that um, we are not boldly talking about. So the same sources of information that have sent it out there uh, that, you know, HIV is, is manageable. And I think the one thing that we constantly get wrong is comparing mm -hmm. uh, the, the yeah. you know, the diseases mm -hmm. or the conditions. Mm -hmm. Oh, HIV is better than, mm -hmm. than this. Than cancer, yeah. for yeah. example. Yeah. Like we are propagating, we shouldn't, we no. shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do I mean, these are two, it's like comparing apples and, peach, and, and, and peaches or oranges. These are totally different things. And people who are uh, living with diabetes, for example, do not uh, necessarily have to be stigmatized because it's not sexually transmitted. I mean, the whole basis of, of HIV stigmatization starts from the fact that and the notion that it is sexually transmitted and mm. sex is still highly stigmatized in our society. Mm. So the fact that we want to sit and compare, like I sit down with a, another young person, I'm like, Ash, me, I have HIV, I'm fine. You... You have diabetes, Ash, I don't think you'll make it. Mm. That's the kind of, 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 of um, communication and information that mm. we're giving that is making us lose mm. it all. Mm. Because, yeah, what, like, for example, I think I also mentioned here in the previous show that when um, I started treatment, I was told, if you don't take your medicine, you will die. You miss your medicine once, you don't die. What does that tell you? <laughs> They're lying, right? So it's the same thing. It's the same thing with all this comparison. Oh, diabetes is worse than HIV. HIV is worse than TB. TB is worse mm. than what? These are all issues that are at some point might even affect one individual, and they may need to be addressed. While we are not, uh, I'm not encouraging working in silos because also we do not live single issue lives. It is important that we stop the comparison, and we embrace diff a, a, a very um, strategic kind of uh, information sharing, for yeah. example. It's yeah. interesting what you just said. So you're saying the harsh truth and the sometimes can be misconstrued as well, because when you mm -hmm. started your treatment, you're saying you're told that if you don't take your medication, you will die. Mm -hmm. That statement in itself was supposed to ensure that you stick to it, did it, convince Except you. 
It's not a harsh truth, Trevor. If, I miss my if it's incomplete information, yeah. it's withholding the important information that I need. At that particular point, when you first test a positive for HIV, you do not need threats to be able to take your medicine. You need someone to sit you down so that you understand this di that diagnosis and how you're able to, to live with it and also ensure that you can manage this condition effectively. So this... Being told that, you know, if, if, for example, I walk into a hospital and my viral load is high, the first thing they say, ah, you want to die. And even if it's two or three days, it happens. Come on. It's, it's, and Dr. Celestine will probably look at me, okay, so she misses. But yes, it happens, you know. And if at that time, and, and I'll, I'll give you another example about what happened to me around that time. So I tested positive when I was 17. I was in high school. And then I was about to sit my secondary school exams, actually, KCSE. And I went, tested on the 1st of July. At that time, we still didn't have test and start, but then they were like, you give, you're given time to go process this. Are you sure uh, you're ready to take medication? Because this is a long-term commitment and all that. So I, I took that time, but I was in school. I wasn't in a home environment or anything of that sort. So when I went back and then there was this information of, you know, if you do not take your medicine, you will die. I was given my medicine. I missed day one. Guess who was alive? Me. I missed day two. Still the same thing. And when we come and we meet other young people, the conversation is around, ah, you also miss yours and you didn't die. Oh, so they're lying to us. And that became the problem. It is not a harsh truth. It is the mm. fact that they did not give me information in a way that I would understand on why this is important to me and why I need to adhere to treatment and not if you don't adhere to treatment, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. I needed to understand that if at all you do not take this medicine, uh, if you take and you stop, you take and you stop, you might uh, develop resistance. And those are the important information. And once I learned that, I couldn't miss my treatment because I was no longer doing it for not to die because at the end of the day, we are all going to die. And you will be surprised at how young people view things. I mean... Even that death doesn't scare them. Nobody's coming out of here alive, yes. right? Yes. So we know that. And the bottom line is, how do I make sure that I'm living a life that is fulfilling in the end? So there is a need for that information to also be packaged in a very different uh, manner that is encouraging and is not threatening. Yeah. yeah. Because Malcolm was talking about packaging that information quickly. People want you to give, the, give me that information in like a minute. Mm -hmm. So... If that's not the statement, then what do you say so that young people get it in a minute and their attention span? What is the best way of getting reaching the younger generation? You've mentioned that some of your peers are saying at 6.30 they are not awake, which is yes. strange. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is the best way of packaging this information then? How do you give quick facts that have some meaning to them? Without threats. Without threats. Yeah. Being the key line, without threats. Um, first, it's important to package the right information. So, for example, I just mentioned something about undetectable equals untransmittable. That in itself is a messaging, it's a campaign that has been running on for the longest. That is, it's helping you as an individual living with HIV. If your main issue has been to, you're afraid to transmit the virus to someone else, you know that if you take your medicine, it is undetect your viral load is undetectable, then you cannot transmit the virus to anybody else sexually or in any other um, manner. So these are some, I'm, I'm using that tagline in itself because a lot of folks who already know or who are interested in learning more about HIV should already know uh, about undetectable being untransmittable. The other thing is just do it for yourself, like take your meds for yourself. There's different, um, having been here for uh, a long time. There's a lot of different messaging and different packages that have been applied and some of them have worked. Like for example the undetectable one because now I knew that if I take medicine, the only way to stay undetectable is to take medicine or to adhere to your treatment. So yeah, something like that. Keep it short. Keep it uh, straight to the point. Keep it positive. Don't threaten people. Yeah. I mean, undet undetectable equals untransmittable could have, on the flip side, been used as probably detectable equals death or detectable equals HIV infection. But we didn't go in that direction. Mm. We chose to uh, work with positive messaging, for instance. The young yeah. people you speak to even up to now, what is their reaction when you reveal your status? And I think it's commendable that you are able to say this on air. What okay. do they tell you? Um, it's no longer, a, a, okay, it is a surprise in some instances, but I, the young people that surround me are mostly young people in my space, like they already know this, but I just recently 
Yeah, I'm going to say a lot on air today. Yeah. <laughs> I joined the dating app. And you joined the dating app? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> and I it's met a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people who are very new to this, did not yeah. know about undetectable uh, or HIV, and they've never even had to think about HIV a day in their lives, because you only think about HIV when you are engaging in um, explorative sexual behavior, or risky, or having multiple sexual partners and stuff. So this um, this whole thing became actually became interesting as work for me because then I, I started sampling different people and how they understand or how they pick this information. And one person asked me one thing: just tell me where it is written that you cannot transmit the virus. And I googled, and they looked at the source of the Google. They say WHO is there. They're like, ah. Nice. Well done. I mean, a lot has, has gone on. Yeah. And, and that has really, um, every time when I'm disclosing my status, I expect people to withdraw to, um, it's, it's the, the, the state of the mind, just in case they, they react in a certain manner, you're able to protect your emotions. But I, I've been surprised a lot of people, when you tell them that kind of information, that you're no longer infectious, which was the, which was the initial issue with HIV, then they, they're fine. Okay. They have no problem. All right. Yeah. Malcolm, let me bring you back on this. When you were distributing the more than 200,000 condoms that you mentioned during the safari rally, what kinds of conversations were you having with the young people? Is it that are they now not more scared of the infections? Because I find that interesting. Because how are they there? Were they there without it, that you're the only ones who gave it to them at that point? Or what was the plan? Because by the time I come to you and I take... Mm. They had no condoms problem. from you, it mm. means I didn't have them. Mm. So what was the plan? Mm. Uh, thank you for that, Trevor. First of all, uh, if you're planning to go out, condom is not part of your essentials. Ina kwanga mambo ni matatu. Beba sweater, akili, na chaja. Na akili na chaja. Mambo ni matatu. Leo ni Friday tunangia weekend. Yes. So condom is not part of the conversation. Condom is not part of the essentials. And remember, Unaenda Sherehe, you are going to be under the influence of drugs, depending with your poison. Yeah. So uh, for Safari Rally, people knew that they were going to watch the cars and they were going to have fun. So the part of carrying condom was not part of their conversation, not part of their uh, essentials to carry. So for us, we saw that as an opportunity that these are, there are going to be a lot of young people during the safari rally. Yeah. What can we do to reduce the number of new infections that are going to rise from this uh, one event in, that is happening in our country? So uh, that's why we decided to set up a medical camp. Uh, uh, during the medical camp, condoms were being distributed. We had uh, young people who were branded uh, as life of the party. Yeah. Uh, these young people were walking and having one-on-one -on -one conversation with other peers uh, on ground during the safari rally and just having the conversation about the importance of using condom, the importance of using condom consistently and correctly because a lot of people out here still don't know how to use a condom correctly and consistently. An example is I can meet a lady tonight in the club, we go home, uh, that night we'll probably use a condom, but in the morning the condom won't be part of the conversation. It will be maybe beba only trust, something of sort. And then you'll end up uh, engaging in a, uh, in a risky sexual behavior. Yeah. So uh, for us, uh, we used peers to reach out to peers because uh, when I approach you with your girlfriend and you go like, bro, check this, weke, sidi mpangoni nini nini. Ndiyo wata feel shy and uh, some sort of, but maybe hatataka kuchukua in front of the, of the girlfriend or the partner, Maybe they will just atakufata um, badaya kwa mbio bro cheki. Sunsaidia mani. Kwa na hile ukona maziwa, ukona jembe. So you kama contraband then. So, but there are some who will uh, proudly take, even some will say, give me a whole box. I need to, to take back to my friends who are at home. Yeah. So um, for us, we use a, a model that is called a peer-to-peer -peer approach because mm. what we notice is that um, 
<laughs> Sorry, that <time. laughs> we, we call them the uh, young at heart. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, the young at heart, if you go to a, a, a young person, they will look at you as a parent, as a mm. teacher, as mm. a pastor. So having that conversation about uh, using condom, picking up a condom, they will shy away from that kind of conversation. But if it's a peer-to-peer -peer approach, someone my age met, having that conversation, I'll be comfortable mm. to talk about condom with that uh, person. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier on the communication that should be done, and you said that we should start them young. Should we categorize this conversation and mm. pick one line of conversation and go with it? Because when we were younger, mm -hmm. there's, and of course I'm a senior youth now, there was <laughs> conversations on abstinence. Yes. Nobody said anything about condom use. Nobody said anything about anything else. Yes. The only thing that was being drummed in your head was abstinence. So much so that it got to a point that even in the school desks, we did not want to sit next to girls. Yeah. My peers had to, had to be boys, yes. the three of them, because we were told that you need to stay away from the girls. Mm -hmm. Should we take a one unidirectional conversation and just push that, depending on the team that you're talking to. If you're talking to young people, mm. tell them it's abstinence. If you're talking to maybe the youth, mm. tell them it's condom use or what happens? Are we bombarding the younger generation with too much information at the same time that they feel they have too many options? Mm. They can either choose to use a condom, they can use to abstain, they can use to... Are we giving them too many options? Thank you for that. And uh, according to the programming that is still happening in the country, ABC is still being a uh, uh, applied mm. across the country. Mm. That is abstinence, being faithful and uh, consistent, consistent use of condoms. Mm. So it is, uh, uh, the, the conversation is divided into according to the age band, mm. age group. Mm. Because for someone who, who is below the age of 18, you can't go to them and talk about condom. You can't go to, uh, to them and talk about being faithful. And because yet we know that the sexual debut age is down <coughs> below. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. below. So these are minors. Mm -hmm. So to the minors, we have to have the conversation about um, sexual purity, about be, uh, abstaining, mm -hmm. yeah. about um, uh, having uh, the correct information in terms of uh, abstinence and in terms of sexual purity. Yeah. But when we, when we come to the uh, slightly above the age of 18, mm -hmm. that's then when we can have the conversation about uh, the uh, uh, protection. That's when you can have uh, the conversation about being faithful in, re in relationship because someone who is slightly, uh, uh, someone who is 19 and above is someone who is, um, who is, in a relationship, yeah. who is trying to explore their sexual life, who is trying to uh, uh, just understand and figure it uh, to figure out life yeah. in general. So, all these age age, age groups, mm. the information should be categorized according to the age age bracket. Mm -hmm. When we talk to the couples, we talk about being faithful in marriage and relationship. Mm. So. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay. Yeah. Mugabe, see you shaking your head. You don't believe in that unilateral direction mm. of conversation. No, I'm in, so I'm in total agreement. Yeah. Remember, I, I talked about knowing your audience. Yes. So you're not going to have a group of 10 to 14 year olds and you're talking about condoms. For, uh, at that age, you're talking about sexual purity, abstinence, knowing your body. Yeah. And that's why sexuality education is so important, right from the home all the way up to the school. So even talking to young people uh, less than 18 around condoms, like under 17, it's actually contextual. We know there are some setups where you cannot talk about that. And that's why for us, you know, we used to program from 15 to 24, we've actually lowered it to 10. Yeah. Because what you do in a child between the ages of, of 10 to 14 affects how their 15 to 19 is and 20 to 24 is going to be. So you have to look at young people along the life course, yeah? So you start early so that they're actually growing up that's knowing that sexual purity is good. And actually we do advocate for sexual purity and for abstinence because abstinence does work. Yeah. Every risky sexual encounter you have these three outcomes. Either you will get pregnant, either you're going to get HIV or get another STD. Yeah. So even as we give our messaging, that is what we are saying. And like if HIV is not a priority, then we talk about STIs and pregnancy. And what we're seeing now is a resurgence of STIs and what we call super gonorrhea. And we know the risk of getting HIV when you've got gonorrhea, that risk is fivefold. So we are going to lower the HIV uh, incidence, the numbers, have an upsurge of STIs, and then we go back. So it's going to be, we're going to be in a vicious cycle. Yeah. So programming and messaging, how we do it, it is age specific. 
it is contextualized to where you are because we know we have got 15, 16 years in this country, unfortunately, who are married. Yeah. So you will have a different conversation around HIV prevention with them and prevention of artificial transmission of, of HIV. Okay, yeah. but we are also integrating um, other discussions, not just talking about HIV, but issues of mental health, alcohol and substance use and abuse and gender-based violence and yeah and also looking at how we reduce poverty and inequalities yeah. yeah the reason why i'm pushing that narrative it comes back to what we were discussing with prof earlier on the development in technology because mm. you know back in the day you could categorize based on age brackets mm. because you know that the six-year-olds are doing this and this and that yes. but now yes. six-year-olds already have access to gadgets yes that sometimes you're talking about sexual purity yes. then they're looking at other videos that are telling yes. them otherwise so yes. the conversation they should be having at that point mm. is almost accelerated, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Because when you st speak to them about abstinence and they already have access to gadgets that are showing them other things, mm. they should be spoken to about yes. using protection. Yes. So are we, is this where technology is now ahead of everyone else? That if you sit them down and have a conversation with them, you're speaking to the wrong audience with the right age. You're expecting this, this age you are supposed to talk about sexual purity, but your audience is way ahead of you mm. based on what they've been exposed to. Professor said technology, depending on how you use it, is good or bad. Yeah. But technology is just a platform. But sometimes we take it as the end all and be all. And like Malcolm mentioned, and they mentioned, not every young person is on social media. During our survey, there's some young people even reading and writing is a problem. So how are they going to be on social media? Even if you give them a leaflet, they cannot read. So you have to look for other mechanisms. And I think, you know, whoever gets the story out there, it is taken as the gospel truth, regardless whether it is factual or not, okay? And so I think sometimes we, we are sort of playing catch up with technology because there's a lot of misinformation out there. But as we are doing our campaigns, we're doing them online and offline, okay? What he mentioned, peer-to-peer -peer and also at social media. But you also need to remember that this six-year-old is not living by himself, eh? Mm. He's living in somebody's house. And even the 17-year-old, as you want to give them information, you also have to think about their autonomy. So you want him to go and get tested and you want him to get access to a condom and go to a health facility. He's living with his parents. How does he start that conversation if you've also not talked to the parents and the environment? And that's why I was saying information is one thing, but if we don't have a system that supports young people to access correct information and uh, uh, the adequate services, then I think we are, we are shooting ourselves. We'll be, we'll be shooting in the dark for the longest time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Prof, there's an entire legal perspective to this whole thing. You are a member of the HIV and AIDS Tribunal. Mm. What is your mandate and what sort of cases do you handle? Well, th <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yeah, so the HIV and AIDS Tribunal is, um, is, uh, is within the judiciary of Kenya. It's... Um, its mandate is to, there is an HIV and uh, AIDS Prevention and Controls Act that um, is an additional tool to the efforts that the government has placed in combating HIV and AIDS uh, issues. So the tribunal largely deals with the issues of the people being tested for HIV without their consent. It also deals with the issues of uh, people not getting pre- and post-test counseling when the HIV test is being done, uh, disclo disclosure uh, and um, uh, HIV uh, disclosure without the consent of the person who is HIV positive. Uh, like today, you've complimented uh, <coughs> Joyce for coming out publicly and talking about, about her HIV status. But it would be illegal for me to mm. tell people that Joyce is HIV positive. It's mm. hard to tell people mm. or to give me permission to tell people. Mm. So that is against the law. And then issues of um, discrimination because you have been found to be HIV positive. And we've seen situations where you are not given a job because you have tested uh, HIV positive and all that. So the government intentionally and purposely set up this tribunal for people to have uh, their issues uh, addressed. So if you feel that your rights as a HIV infected person is infringed on, then you come to the tribunal and it is uh, part of the judiciary. It sits as a court. We listen to the evidence that you provide and we have the ability to, to fine and to issue orders and sanctions against the perpetrator. Yeah. What are some of the most successful cases that you handle? I know you can't go into the details of it all, yeah. but what have you been seeing over time? 
people okay, over time. Really. Okay, so some, <clears throat> you not believe it, uh, in this present day and age, you find a school, for example, a headmistress, uh, a child comes to, to school in Form 1, uh, they're HIV positive, and uh, the school says, no, 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 we cannot admit you. Simply because of that? Because of your HIV status. Mm -hmm. And uh, we force the school. We, this is a law. You apply the, the law, and the, the school is forced to admit uh, a student. Or uh, social media. Uh, we are in a WhatsApp group, and uh, we disagree with you. And certainly, I post it, and I say, oh, you know, he's, you're behaving like this because you're HIV positive. You know, those kind of things. Uh, and we, we've had those kind of cases, and, uh, and we find you. Yeah. Yeah, for, for, so you for give that. actual monetary we do. compensation? We do. Okay. Yeah. Where, do, where does someone go if they want? <clears throat> so the HIV... Uh, they, is there a physical space they should come? Or yes. So, for, so people in Nairobi, the, the offices are at Insurance Plaza, 12th floor, and they can come and do that. Uh, but we, are, we have presence uh, all over the countries, like in the former provincial headquarters like Nakuru, Kisumu, uh, you know, those kind of uh, uh, places, Mombasa, yeah. and they can go to the court or wherever they are, even in a, within a, uh, any other court, Mashinani, if you go and inquire about a HIV tribunal, you should be able to get information. Okay. It's been made so easy, you can even, um, you know, uh, we do not follow the strictness of the laws in terms of, you know, uh, kicking you out on a technicality and all that. Uh, you don't need to have a lawyer to represent you. You can represent yourself or you can have somebody, um, you know, to help you to file your cases. But in addition to that, the government has uh, placed uh, pro bono lawyers. Uh, these are lawyers who can represent you for free. So if you need, uh, if you need uh, somebody to push your case for you, you, you can have access to uh, pro bono lawyers, and that again is you can get information from the HIV uh, tribunal. The other final thing that I must say, the government has also made it very easy for you in terms of cost. You don't pay anything. You know, to file a case uh, in court, uh, you are required to pay for any other, uh, any suit that you file. But for HIV tribunal, it is free. It's probably the only uh, court or tribunal where you can file a case for free. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's see what you're saying online. There's a lot of feedback coming through. Let's read that, and then I'll come to each and every one of you to give your recommendations going forward when it comes to dealing with HIV and AIDS. You can categorize them for the boys, the girls, the parents, or if you want blanket recommendations, it would be great going forward. How do we ensure that the infections keep going lower? We know now that the infections are declining, but there's still a cohort there that is a bit of a concern. Engineer Lazaro says, higher percentage of HIV new information rates in youth contributed by the following drug abuse, poverty, and just normal peer pressure. Good number of NGOs are only profiting over this issue instead of giving out proper information. Okay. Gabi says the Kenyan HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Act 2006 criminalizes intentional transmission of HIV and AIDS. Those found guilty should face penalties. It's crucial for individuals to prioritize informed consent and regular testing to prevent the spread of HIV and AIDS. We can talk about this in a bit, but let's see. Let's continue first. Bobo Tieno says increased high cases of HIV among the youth is due to alcoholism, abuse of drugs, or parties during activities where they gather together like rugby, football matches, or the just concluded safari rally and government has slowed down on sensitization. Okay. Kalulu says, when we were young, our parents only said Wasichana no Abaya, but no one ever said <coughs> where this Ubaya was. <laughs> the younger generation of parents should be more intentional with info about HIV and AIDS and unplanned pregnancies. Okay. Babu Michael says, sex education and information about HIV infections precautions should be taught and made available to youths when schooling and as they progress further with education like it was before. On this, we have dropped the ball and lost the focus. Let's hold on, Babu Michael, for a bit and hear what Mugambi has to say. Is this true what he's saying? Sex education information about HIV infections should be taught and made available to youth when schooling and as they progress further with education? Because there's been a lot of controversy on this. Mm. At what point do you start this conversation? Parents think their children are still too young to be given this information, then they stop you from it, but the children are actually having these conversations among themselves. So I think two things I would say. You have to distinguish between sex education 
and sexuality education. And sometimes I see the two words normally mm. confuse us, and that's why we have a lot of controversy. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about sexuality education, it is not about the actual sexual act. That is only, I think, a very small percentage of sexuality education. You're talking about knowing your body, about how your body is developing. You're talking about menstrual health, menstrual hygiene. For the young boys, even knowing how to do, to check for testicular cancer, how to deal with your hormones, that is the whole concept of sexuality education. And if you think about sexuality, you actually express it every single day in how you engage, how you hold, how you touch, how you speak, and even how you dress. So we have to debunk that Sexuality education is about teaching children about sex. Mm. So you start as early as possible. If you've got small children, if you're going to bath them, talk about their body parts, and their body parts are private. That is sexuality education. There is nothing wrong, there's nothing dirty about that. So it starts from the home. It's also not the work of the school to give that information. That being said, we have worked uh, with the Ministry of Education, with the KICD. They've been an amazing, amazing partner. I have to really give credit to them. Yeah. In looking at the curriculum on... Um, HIV and AIDS prevention in looking at even human sexuality context. And if you look at what is being taught now around HIV prevention, it's not as stigmatizing as it was a couple of, of, of years ago. And those things of saying AIDS, uh, HIV kills are no longer in the curriculum, or they should not be. Mm -hmm. So we're still working with them to review the curriculum as they do the CBC reforms for the older classes. But there's that structured engagement around HIV prevention, sexuality education in the schools, but also around the communities. And I, I like what somebody said about the whole house and the parenting, but I think also it's time for parents also to, to step up and give this information. But I have also realized you cannot give what you don't have. Mm. Because like he rightly said, we were told boys are bad run. Yeah. We're still waiting for the bad news of the boys <laughs> <laughs> at this age, okay? Yeah. So we also have to create mechanisms that support parents to know how to start. It's a difficult discussion to start with your children. I'll have to admit to it. But so also that support uh, is, is required. Okay. Yeah, and so it's a multi-pronged approach. All right. Mm. Prof, there was also another legal question conversation there when somebody said that it's a criminal to intentionally transmit HIV and AIDS. I think the problem now comes in on the proof part. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I saw that and uh, mm -hmm. I thought I should get an opportunity to correct it because yeah. that was actually in the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Controls Act, mm -hmm. but it was, it was found, the High Court uh, found it to be uh, unconstitutional, so it's no longer part of the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Controls Act because it's the, the issues of proof mm. and uh, b b becomes a challenge. And so it's no longer uh, considered uh, one, of the, one of the provisions of the act. Okay, I'll come to you each for closing remarks really quick. Joyce, I see you have something to say there, but let's finish up with the feedback first. Brian Chemwa mm -hmm. says the government can provide training on communication skills, decision making, and assertiveness to empower youth to negotiate after safer sexual practices and resist peer pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Godi says there is a long chain of misinformation out there regarding the management of HIV and AIDS and STIs. The Ministry of Health should step up to volunteer correct information and adequately sensitize our communities about this scourge. Okay. Andrew says we need to go back to religious institutions. Most young people are lost due to the lack of a moral compass. My age group trusts more the music they hear and shows they watch, and honestly speaking, they promote a lot of sexual immorality. Okay. Lilian Sioi Moshimiwa says there is an open commitment from the Ministry of Health to fighting the rising numbers of HIV and AIDS and STIs. This is evident in the fact that the Kenya Kwanzaa administration has hired a sufficient number of CHPs mm -hmm. at the community level. Mm -hmm. All right. Joyce, I'll start with your closing remarks. Uh, what do you recommend going Trevor. forward? Um, I'd like to say that, one, uh, young people are not the same person. We are not homogeneous, so we need different levels of programming. And to finalize, young people need more than just information. Mm. We need access to HIV treatment care and support services and commodities, which sometimes are on stock up for story for another day. And most importantly, let young people show you how to, to, to do the programming and um, you know do what is responsive for the young people themselves. Yep, thank okay. you. Malcolm, closing remarks um, and recommendations going forward. <clears throat> um, me, uh, for me, I would say let's uh, use protection. To see a group of people, if you are sexually active, mm. if you are abstaining, keep it that way. Mm. And if you are in a relationship, kindly mm. uh, be faithful. Tunakuomba. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Mugambi? 
Um, so everybody has talked about information, so I'll talk about what we are doing. So as the NSTCC, we are, I think in the course of this month, launching a campaign targeting adolescents and young people 10 to 24 called Jijali, capital G for generation, apostrophe Jali. So mind about yourself, care about yourself, which is a HIV prevention campaign, but looking at several pillars of sexual and gender-based violence, menstrual health, alcohol and drug abuse, and the whole how to keep yourself whole and better for, uh, for your future. So the campaign is coming, targeting the different facets of young people in their different diversities. It's going to be an online campaign. We'll have on-ground activation peer-to-peer. -peer. So just to ask people to look out for that. But number two, please remember who we're talking about are still children. 15-year-olds are still children. And so we, as a country, we have to be mindful and deliberate about child protection. So we should not normalize conversations of 17, 15-year-olds being sexually active and being at risk. We should be asking ourselves why and putting in place top-up measures to protect them yeah. for their future. Thank so you. The campaign is called Jijali. It's called Jijali. Coming soon. OK. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Prof. Uh, Doc has uh, snatched the thing that I wanted to say, but it's really to, to uh, remind the young people that this is their life yeah. and, um, and this is their future. So um, they need to take control of their lives and, 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 and ensure that uh, whatever they engage in um, may or may not uh, damage their future. So if they want to secure their future, they need to, to uh, protect their lives. All right. Thank you so much for making time this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Walter Jaoko, Director of CAVI and member of the HIV and AIDS Tribunal. Dr. Celestine Mugambi, Head of Technical Support at NSDCC. Joyce Ouma, Senior Program Officer, Y Plus Global. And Malcolm X, Andrew Maisha Yu. Thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. And thank you all for the feedback that you sent through. We are taking a break now. When you come back, it's Roy T-Boy on the decks. My name is Trevor Mbija. Have a fantastic weekend ahead. God bless. <laughs>